What's up, Ozones? Welcome to the Ozone and welcome to a reaction video. Um, I don't do these often because um, they're kind of a pain to record uh, and I've kind of defaulted to my laptop camera, so I'm so sorry that the camera quality is terrible, but you're here for my reaction and you can see my reaction anyway, so it's all good. Um, I will upgrade the camera if I need to later down the line. Anyway, MatPat has just dropped FNAF, the ultimate timeline. Um, I think he said this was like a three-parter or something, so I wouldn't be surprised if... Well, obviously, like, it's 19 minutes long, it can't be the full timeline, surely. Um, but, um, I'm very excited for this. I've been pumped for this for ages. They have taken a while to make this, so hopefully it's up to good standards. I am a FNAF theorist, if you don't know. Well, I say that, but I'm not, like, too deep into the... into FNAF theorizing, but I really love... Um, the story of FNAF, and I'm, I'm interested to see uh, where this timeline goes. So, without further ado, let's get into the timeline. Today we end the torment. 19 books, 11 games, 19 eight books. whole Jesus. years. All leading to this moment. The ultimate FNAF timeline is finally complete. The pieces yeah. are in place for us. Now all we have okay. to do is put this story of tragedy, jealousy, and loss back together. I'm so Hello, hyped for this. Internet. Welcome to Game Theory, the show that feels like a kid revealing the class project that he's been working on all year. <laughs> Except here, it's the class project that I've been working on for the past decade of my life. Show this and tell. This one is big, Truly. my friends, and I gotta admit, kinda nervous. I haven't attempted a timeline video on this franchise since 2018. Back in the days when Mike was the crying child, Afton coming back was actually a surprise, and Fazgu <laughs> wasn't a phrase I'd ever thought I'd have to utter. But since the last yeah. time I did something like this, we've had three more massive games, the death yep. and revival of the FNAF movie, and more yep. robot kids than you can shake a staff by. Yeah, it is exhausting the, trying yeah, to keep sure. track of this whole franchise, which yep. honestly is why I'm here today. The lore at this point is complicated. It is full of speculation and theory, so to hopefully make it I a think little the books easier have for been everyone a big part and to give us all a baseline recently. to talk about this franchise moving forward um, into the future, it's time to reveal my current working FNAF okay. timeline. But just before I do, I just want to explain a couple of things. First, this timeline is massive. Seriously, mm -hmm. it is huge. This thing towers over any video project we have ever done on the channel. Understandable. But when you look at the totality of this franchise, the story of FNAF really boils down to the story of one man, William Afton. His successes, his failures, his yep. rise to becoming co-owner of one of the most successful restaurant franchises in the world, and his eventual fall to the monsters he helped to create, only to then be reborn in a new digital form later. That's why I've That's decided spooky. to split this timeline that. into three main chunks. The foundation of Freddy's, how yep. a business started, and how it came into being, the Afton era, William's decades-long murder spree, and post-Purple Guy. Basically modern FNAF, everything that happens after the pizzeria simulator fire. And because there are lots of new big revelations in this thing that seemingly come out of nowhere, as well as just points I want to talk about further, I decided to dedicate one episode to each chunk. I originally wanted it to be one right. seamless continuous okay. video, but it just felt incomplete without... So, before he continues, I'm sure he's going to say this, but I think that the hardest part of the timeline to put together is the first part, the Foundation of Freddy's, because there isn't really much that we can go off of, apart from, I guess, kind of pulling things from the books uh, and seeing how that kind of ties in. But also, like, the first death of the series, like, the first big death of the series is kind of hard to put together. You've got Charlotte as a potential, you have Elizabeth as a potential, and you have the bite victim as the bite of 83, um, as a big potential of that, and a lot of people say that, um, either Elizabeth, probably Elizabeth, I would say, uh, either Elizabeth or the bite victim is probably William's motivation to go on and kill others, but yeah, I don't know. I don't know how much that holds up, so hopefully he's gonna get, um, kind of good motive for, um, good motivation for Afton being a killer. Because that's something that we all kind of look for in these timelines, primarily, I would say some sort of explanation at the end of each one. Once this whole thing's done, I promise I'm gonna merge all the narrative bits into one massive video so you can just skip my explanations. But for now, this just felt like the best, most satisfying, most oh, definitely, yeah. way to do this. Yeah. That being said, this is still about the story, the broad strokes of the franchise. So in order to make sure that you guys know that I'm not just pulling answers out of thin air, not only am I discussing some of the more controversial bits at the end of each chunk, we're also putting in a handy little graphic in the bottom left-hand corner of the screen, which will show thumbnails, video 
no wow. titles, books, and any other citations that we Dedication. made throughout the video. Dedication! So if you wish to understand that specific statement in more detail... Matt gave birth to Springtrap! That way you can look into those details for yourself. <laughs> so sit back, grab yes. some popcorn, or your pitchforks okay. if you're the type to get upset when I say something controversial, and make sure that you subscribe, since this is going to be a video that you're going to want to come back it. to a Let's few go. times in order to fully dissect. Without any more waiting, I present to you the story of a loving, obsessive father who slowly descended into madness, and along the way, discovered the secret to eternal life. Yeah. Sounding good so far. <laughs> Our story begins not in the 1980s, or even in the 1970s, but all the way back in the 1930s. It was the throes huh? of the Great Depression, and people were in desperate need of cheap <laughs> entertainment, especially in Utah, oh, yes, the one FNAF of the state's big artists, fourth highest unemployment in the nation, and full of transients. Okay. People looking for work in Salt Lake, finding none, and ultimately moving on to find their fortunes out in California. People were tired, and they were hungry. But as they traveled, there was one thing that could lift their spirits. A simple roadside attraction called Fred Bear singing show. Okay, 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 okay. Hold up a second. Hold up a second. So first of all, like, I guess a good point is, like, why did Scott choose Utah out of, like, all of the US states? Um, and I don't really have an answer for you. There could be some kind of, like, history with Utah? I don't, I don't really know. We haven't looked too deep into that, I don't think. But I mean, it's also just, like, a a, a state that he just threw out there in the in the silver ice just like oh yeah it happens in utah whatever um but like it, it can it might not be that deep honestly but um then second thing hmm <laughs> i get that it's a 1930s aesthetic right it's black and white it's kind of classic like mickey mouse days i guess um i'm thinking of steampunk willy uh <laughs> but like I don't know if it's just a stylized thing or if Freddy's actually did exist back in the 1930s, but that's interesting that he's pointing that out. So let's let's continue with this. Show. The ads were plastered all over town, right. featuring an animated bear drawn in the popular pie-eyed cartoon style mm -hmm. for characters at the time. He resembled cartoons like Mickey Mouse, Felix there the Cat, go. Betty Boop. It immediately said that this, Fred Bears, was a place where you could bring the family. And the price? Honestly, couldn't be beat. For 50 cents, you could get food and entertainment as you walked the local trained real life dancing <laughs> bear perform on stage. Normally, you'll real see life. dancing bears at large traveling circuses like Barnum and Bailey. Where the real life dancing bear, dollar. really? That's a dollar without food. But this was a smaller show, like the type from the Vaughn Brothers or the Robbins Brothers, okay. where tickets would sell for just a mere 50 cents. Watching that bear do tricks on stage brought a glimmer of joy at a time when so much was wrong with the world. The simple show would go on for years, bringing happiness to hundreds of travelers passing through looking for a This is a lot of speculation. An impression on one little boy, capturing his imagination in a way that nothing else had. One little boy <laughs> named Billy. That was his nickname, at least, but his parents liked to call him William. This William is so Ed. stupid, I'm sorry. <laughs> could sing. For decades, William dreamed of recreating that moment of bringing a musical bear to life, but how? William was smart, <laughs> without a doubt. I can't William take this seriously. He had a mind for business, but he wasn't the most creative. How do you make a singing, dancing bear come to life? The best he could do was using rudimentary costumes. William was inspired by the work of Walt Disney, who throughout the 50s and 60s was pioneering the use of mascot suits throughout his theme park. The mm -hmm. big innovation, suits with five fingers. This allowed the performers wearing yeah. the suits to use their natural arms and hands to interact with the guests, as opposed to the older models where the arms would just hang limply by their sides. Finally, with a simple mascot suit, he would be able to realize his childhood dream. He would be able to bring Fred Bear to life. To appeal to the kids, and for copyright reasons, he changed Fred Bear from a realistic brown animal to a cartoonish yellow bear with a purple hat and bow tie. Okay. But feeling like one character wasn't enough, he added another friend, a yellow rabbit with a purple vest and matching tie named Bonnie the Bunny. While Fred Bear was certainly his first love, Bonnie was extra special because that was his. It was an original character that he had created from scratch. And I do mean sure, scratch. Sure. William's hand-sewn costumes were rough with seams and stitches visibly showing. Yeah. But it was the best that he could do. And you know what? It was just enough. Bonnie and Fred Bear would perform on stage to small but enthusiastic crowds. Finally, he was able to deliver fantasy and fun to all the kids, delighting and inspiring them in the exact okay, way that he had been delighted and inspired yeah, that's my so many question. years ago. 
And things could have ended there. That could have been the end to his story. It could have been perfect had it not been for one thing. Other people saw the success of his idea and they wanted in. Enter Chica's Party World, a rival restaurant starring performing animal characters. His idea, except they did it better. William may have been the first, but obviously he wasn't the best. It hurt the prideful William Afton to okay. admit it, but this restaurant was able to do the thing that he always wanted to do. I see where this is going. I see where this is going. It is going. Um, there are basically loads of original companies or whatever, or franchisees uh, that kind of combine into one. Uh, and I'm assuming this is going to have a lot to do with the mediocre melodies because they are like off-brand second-hand kind of um, c characters that were produced because they because of copyright reasons and stuff like that, you know? So I, I have a feeling that's going to tie into this conversation right here. Always wanted to do. Make the animals actually come to life. All of the performers in this restaurant were robots. Simple metal skeletons that were powered by battery packs. But all of them able to freely turn and talk and dance on their own. No human required. It was like magic. Magic that came from the mind of a brilliant creator named Henry Emily. There this he is. In some small way had been able to harness the power of life itself. Afton admired him. He was jealous, to be sure. But he also looked upon this man with awe. Off to one side of Chica's party world was a small cabaret stage featuring an elephant magician. On the other, a hippo known to ramble on and on. That one was more of a joke for the parents. But it was the main stage that was for the kids. There we go, yeah. A rocking band Copy of cover. characters featuring yep. a yellow chicken thing with a southern drawl named Chica, backed by a band of other country-themed characters, including a pig with a banjo, an upbeat frog from the local swimming hole, and a brown bear with a heavy southern accent. Wait, a bear? But bears were his animals. Why not a cow or a horse? Something oh. that fit the country theme a bit better. Why did have so this to is be a hatred bear. for Henry. And adding insult to injury, they had the nerve to call this thing Ned Bear, Ned bear. a direct yeah. copy of his own Fred Bear. <laughs> Whoop, that's gonna leave a mark. No, that was not okay. Afton's jealous admiration turned to hardened bitterness. A bitterness that would only grow over the next couple of years as families continued to choose Chica's party world over okay. Fred Bears. William just couldn't compete with the appeal of the robots. Eventually, his restaurant would go bankrupt, only to get bailed out by, of course, Henry Emily. Another insult, uh, another humiliation that William wouldn't soon forget. Okay, okay, so I'm liking this. I'm really liking this because it's setting up some central themes for later parts of the timeline, such as the fact that William has a... Uh, is despising Henry for this reason. Uh, it's kind of his motive for killing Charlotte, of course. Um, and also just, like, their partnership in the first place, because what was it... Um, Oh, I'm trying to find words. Uh, like, what was it during their partnership where William was like, okay, I'm going to turn on this guy? Because they, they built, like, a really cool uh, animatronic place. Uh, pizzeria is the word I'm looking for. <laughs> they built really cool pizzerias. They, you know, they were, like, the central place for it. Uh, they were developing technology very fast. And, like, what, what was the thing that, like, made William turn around? That's, like, the big question here. And I think that is a good answer for it. The only thing is, I think a lot of this narrative is all kind of made up. It's hypothetical, which I respect because, of course, we don't have much to go off of, as I said before. Um, but I really like how he is bringing this story into it. I thought the dancing bear was a little bit, you know, stretchy. Um, but... Yeah, I, I like the n narrative of this that he's brought up so far. Forget. 1979. Despite being bitter, Afton couldn't deny that what came next was a period of massive success and expansion. With the two franchises yeah. now merged into one, it was the best of both worlds. Afton's ideas with Henry's robotic expertise. The two men decided to launch under a new name, Fred Bear's Family Diner, a pizza chain that would eventually come to feature a mix of humans in performing suits as well as on-stage animatronics. They decided to stick with Fred Bear as the headliner considering the Yellow Bear was easily identifiable as a brand because he was the original performing animal mascot. Yep. Afton appreciated that. This new restaurant would also see a mix of characters as the two franchises merged into one, oh. with Pink Patch and Happy Frog performing right alongside Fred Bear and Bonnie. And as part of this one big Fred Bear family, they even got themselves official merch that were released ranging from masks to magnets. Fair enough. So, wait, 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 wait. One thing I just thought of off the top of my head. Sorry to keep pausing, by the way, but this is like a, a more like a discussion reaction. I'm sorry if you don't like that sort of content, but um, I... Oh, frick, what was I going to say? 
Um, oh, stage 01. Stage 01. That was like the first stage. Uh, it didn't necessarily have to be Fredbear's. So yeah, I think he could be right there. That that was like William's own thing. Then Henry had his own thing. Chica's Party World, supposedly. I don't know if that fits in very well. But um, Chica's Party World, that's a thing. Uh, and then they merge into Fredbear's Family Diner. I quite like that, honestly. Because Chica's Party World doesn't really fit in anywhere else, I would say. Um... So yeah, I, I think that's pretty cool. Yeah. Crappy Mr. Hippo fridge, fridge magnet. <laughs> I'm so sorry. That said, not all the characters were winners. The reception to some characters was just mediocre. So they faded away mediocre into dumpsters, melodies. storage yeah. units, and retro budget tech stores of lost nostalgia, waiting for their chance to step back into the limelight if and when a headliner went out of commission. Others, <laughs> though, would fare much better, like a new pirate fox, as well as a blue guitar playing variant of the yellow Bonnie Bunny. Ultimately, the franchise would get so big, it would spawn its own cartoon show, Fred Bear and Friends. Business oh. was booming. In the end, I'm so sorry to pause again. I'm so, so sorry. Uh, <laughs> uh, I'm going to get stormed in the comments. Um, but the thing I was I forgot to say is um, something that I feel like he could be wrong about is 1979. It seems very, very early for Fred Bears. Um, because I, like one of my main points against that is in Pressure, which is in the third book in the Tales from the Pizzaplex series, uh, it's basically a story about um, Fazbear's Fright. And in it, they said that the Springlock suits were, you know, they were de... They, they weren't used anymore. They were thrown out very shortly after they were kind of used. So essentially what that's saying is that saying that Fredbear's opened. It was booming for a while um, or a short period of time at least. And then... The bite happened, or multiple simultaneous springlock failures happened, and then they stopped using the springlock suits, and that's what brought them to Freddy's, uh, Freddy Fazbear's Pizza. That's what changed Fredbear's, uh, <laughs> sorry, Fredbear's, at Fredbear and Friends to Freddy's, Freddy and Friends. I'm sorry, I'm messing up my words. I'm just gonna continue the frickin' video. <laughs> Fred Bear so and Bonnie's sorry. popularity would be so strong that they would be able to support the Fred Bear's Family Diner franchise all yeah. on their own. While also I'm just off saying three years is a bit dedicated to their long, friends. I think. In 1983, Freddy Fazbear's Pizza launched, giving mm -hmm. a dedicated home to all this new supporting cast of characters. Chica the Chicken, Bonnie the Blue Bunny, Foxy the Pirate, and of course the headliner, a brown Freddy Fazbear. Business was good, and Afton was happy, mostly. It did bother him that the one original character that he created, the one that he himself played, Golden Bonnie, got passed over for inclusion in that cartoon show. The only character in the roster of regulars to get ignored for the show, but other than that, things were going smoothly. He had himself a wife, two sons, a daughter. He had a thriving business. And best of all, he was able to learn the craft of robotics from the man that he both loved and hated, Henry. Together, right. they were constantly pushing the limits of what these characters could do. Because it was quick and easy, new characters introduced into the roster would be given a simple hand-sewn suit with five fingers that any performer could That's wear. That's so so creepy. Henry would design one of his signature <laughs> animatronics for that character, utilizing a divided mouth with either yeah. a hinged or He's sliding this again. jaw design. This was the first generation of animatronics. But why stop there? Afton had big ideas. What if the animatronics weren't just locked to the stage, but could freely roam the restaurant and interact with the kids? What if his mascot Such a bad idea. become animatronics? What if you could use more than just rigid metallic skeletons? Why not experiment with tubes and wires that would give the animatronics mm -hmm. fluidity and flexibility so while still providing location, structure? Location. The possibilities for this technology were endless. Afton fell in love with robotics. He had started with a dream of bringing one simple singing bear to life, but with robots, he had stumbled across the tools that gave him the ability to control life itself. And thanks to Henry, he was practically speedrunning his way to an engineering <laughs> degree. And while William wouldn't admit it out loud, one other thing that kept pushing him forward was the desire to beat his former rival. To prove himself smarter See. and more capable. To surpass the man who everyone else considered to be a visionary genius. But pride cometh before the fall, and tragedy was about to strike. Okay, mm -hmm. so that brings us to the end of part one of the story. That said, at the end of each of these 
chunks, I want to break down some of the logical leaps that I made since the more yeah. narrative format doesn't give me much of a chance to justify a lot of the big decisions. Okay. So admittedly, there are some large leaps in here. Let's just start off with Fred Bear singing show, shall we? We know, based on the retro poster that was hidden in Security Breach, that at least at one point, Fred Bear was an actual bear. And like I called out in that narrative segment, dancing bear shows were a real form of entertainment. The only problem is that, timing-wise, none of our main characters would be the people in charge of that business in yeah, the 30s yeah. and a series of pizza restaurants in the 80s without them just being extremely old. Best case scenario, if Afton's running the singing show when he's 18, that still puts him at nearly 70 when the first pizzeria opens and his murder spree begins. That's it true. It doesn't make That's a true. lot of logical sense. That's why I don't think that it's in the 30s necessarily. I mean, it could be. It could be inspiration for Fred Bear's Family Diner. Absolutely. But I think it's too kind of... Too kind of... Um related you know what i mean i don't i don't know it's it's hard to determine whether it's it's inspiration or it's actually just the same thing but he is kind of right that it is 1930s style so why wouldn't it be from the 1930s i don't know i think we're thinking too hard about this i don't know i, I yeah because he doesn't become immortal until his first death in Spring Trap. That's why I suspect that Fred Bear's singing show was either a family business that Afton then carried on to a new generation, or something that he saw as a kid and just wanted to recreate when he grew up. Okay. The Fred Bear singing show thing also starts laying the groundwork for some of the core elements of this story. Yeah. That Freddy's was a place of fantasy and fun, and that yeah. Afton, despite eventually falling to become the heartless serial killer and mad scientist that we know him as, began as someone with good intentions and a love of entertaining kids. He wanted mm -hmm. to bring things to life from the very beginning. A theme that recurs a lot for him throughout the rest of the franchise. Next up, let's talk about those mascot costumes. One thing that I keep going back to is the design of Glitch Trap. It's a handcrafted suit. You can see the seams and everything. It even has five fingers for the performer's hands. It is very much not a spring trap suit. This is something much more rudimentary. Yes. It came at a time before yeah. animatronics were a part of the story. That's why I suspect that it was actually the first, predating literally everything. It's also a suit that is very personal to Afton. He put his digital consciousness in that form. It's his personal avatar. It's the way that he sees himself. There's also a whole separate discussion to be That's had true. here about the habits and That's rituals true. of serial killers. So the fact that he's choosing to lure kids and kill them in this particular suit actually says a lot about yeah, his emotional absolutely. attachment to it. Yeah. So while Fred Bear seems to have started as someone else's creation, Golden Bonnie was uniquely Williams, giving him a personal connection. And mm -hmm. That's not all. In this whole franchise, only one set of characters have themselves five fingers. The Night Nightmares. Even Golden Freddy, Fredbear was a five-fingered wearable suit at one point in the story, as we see in this shot from the graphic novel. Before he, like everyone else, it's a graphic was novel. It's not accurate, This seems to but... imply that all of the main characters had similar wearable mascot outfits <laughs> at least at one point in time, and that whoever is having the FNAF 4 nightmares, if they even are nightmares, something that we'll touch on in part two, saw those mascot suits specifically. Lastly, we have to talk about the elephant in the room, the literal elephant, Orville Elephant, as well as the rest of the media. Mediocre melodies. Okay. For a while now, I've suspected that the mediocre melodies played a much more important role in the story than just being a bunch more animatronics to fill out the roster. Especially Ned Bear, which is just so suspiciously close to Fred Bear. <laughs> and yet, there are two key details that we're going to have to justify with any mediocre melodies mention. One, they're very rudimentary with external battery packs, implying that they come very early in they're the timeline. Yeah. And two, we know that, at minimum, Mr. Hippo does eventually become an official member of the extended Freddyverse. But if these things are supposed to be cheap generic uh, rip-offs, why would you be trying to rip off yourself? You wouldn't. You would be stealing someone else's ideas. So if Afton created Fredbear, there would have to be some rival franchise. The only other person who would likely be ripping him off? Henry. We've talked extensively about how the mediocre melodies are clearly I Henry's guess. design aesthetic. So it just has to be him. I don't think Henry's doing this maliciously. He doesn't strike me as the type. He was likely building the robots at the orders of someone else that was running a rival restaurant franchise. But that's enough Potentially, motivation to yeah. start Afton down a path of jealous rivalry, Definitely. but also begrudging admiration. As the Freddy Files Ultimate Edition says, it's important to revisit the beginning of Henry and William's relationship, so here you go. I think this is where it begins. Also, this is future Matt Pat here coming back to add this one in. Seems like the recently released character encyclopedia oh, yeah. has backed up all yeah. of this speculation. I think so, I've had yeah. this timeline written for about a month now, but I've also been holding off a bit to see what wrenches this character encyclopedia might throw into it. And on this particular point, I gotta say, it seems like we might actually have nailed it. They actively 
call out the suspicious similarities to the main Fredbear crew. Quote from one of the pages. Ned Bear looks like an imitation, altered mm -hmm. just enough to avoid copyright issues. Yeah. I don't know about you, but that seems to imply that we were right on the money. Knowing all of this, at one point, the franchises had to have merged. That's really the only way that you get Mr. Hippo from the rival franchises part of the Fazbear crew. This also mirrors a lot of what happened in the real life history of oh, Chuck E. Cheese. Oh, yeah, he's bringing this up again. <laughs> each with their own casts of characters yeah. merging to become one unified brand. Again, we've yeah. gone into that in detail with other videos. Just wanted to remind you all of that here. But why would I call out the rival restaurant as being named Chica's Party World? Few things, actually. Good question. First, we know for a fact that a location named Chica's Party World exists. exists. It is yeah. mentioned in the source code teasing sister location. So it is out there somewhere and doesn't fit cleanly anyway. That's why I think it was kind of connected to sister location in some way because Chica wasn't in sister location. Sure, there is a fun time Chica, but Chica isn't in Circus Babies Entertainment and Rental. So Chica must have been separate from um, William at the beginning of the timeline. Absolutely correct. Um, so, I, yeah, I, I actually do like that. I, that just means to me that Circus Babies Pizza World would have to be very, very early on in the timeline as well. Maybe, hmm... I'm trying to think of where, because maybe instead of William, it's hard. It's really difficult to place Circus Baby's Pizza World. We have no indication of when that might be. Same with Sis Location as an entire game, to be fair. But yeah, I, I, yeah, okay. I, I like the fact that he's included Chica's Party World there, because it does tie up a loose end, honestly. Uh, it makes logical sense because Chica wasn't in the Sister Location or Circus Baby's Entertainment Rentals. Yeah, I, 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 I agree with it, honestly. Second, in the story of the Puppet Carver, Chica is very explicitly looped in with the book true. versions of Pig very true. and Ned Bear, implying That's the that she started though. as a mediocre melody. Thirdly, her design just fits it's better with the theme of down-home country animals with southern accents playing the banjo and eating with bibs. And with her being the headliner of the show with her name on the restaurant, it would make sense then that when the restaurants merged, she was the one that was added to the main cast of characters while all the other mediocres That's true. faded away. That's it's also, also true. why when Freddy's closes after William's killing spree, she's the one to branch back off into her old franchise and is therefore missing in sister location. A detail that's bothered me for years at this point. It might also explain why William decided to stuff his first dead kid into Chica. That one I was, was Henry's the first. creation. I saw everything. His. Is all of this a big yeah. leap? Yeah. Is it connecting a lot of dots that are very spread out across the franchise that I've been holding on in the back of my mind for years? Absolutely. But I think it makes sense. It also serves as a clean answer to a lot of the random threads that Scott's been leaving dangling for years. So with all of that in mind my friends we can close the book on the foundation of freddy's and don't worry next week i'll be back to give you arguably one of the most confusing parts of this entire timeline situation really part two the afton era i promise okay. it will actually be next week this time no more waiting around i am just as eager oh, yes! to get this one out the door as Let's you are go. to watch it i promise okay you know what else i promise i promise that we'll actually get to talking about the games i would have liked to have talked about them <laughs> in this episode but there just isn't that that's so funny to me that we haven't even talked about any of the games yet um, we're literally just talking about things that happened before the games. We've been talking for 20 minutes about this. That's kind of crazy to me. That shows the level that FNAF is at compared to everything else uh, in the world uh, in terms of video games and, and their lore much in the games that helps us depict anything pre-Family Diner. Although, let's be honest, this franchise has never been just about the games anyway. Even back in the early yeah. days of FNAF, we were decoding images and source code that Scott fed us through the website. The modern day books and the clues that we get from those things, now they're just modern extensions of that. All of it is crucial to understanding this franchise and its lore. Unless, of course, Steel Wool finally gets around to making that Fred Bear's Family Diner game they want to make so badly. I have always would love to do is get kind of back to... I have no clue if we'll ever be able to do this, but getting back to kind of like the origin of like Fazbear Entertainment yeah. or the mm. origin of of uh, Freddy Fazbear. But in the meantime, while we wait for that inevitably cryptic game, I hope that this start to the timeline helps to fill in some of those gaps. I'm excited to share part two with you next week. If you haven't subscribed and rang the bell, make sure you do it now so you're notified when that part drops. I cannot wait to okay. see your thoughts. Okay, that's it. Wow. <laughs> There's a lot to uh, unpack there, and I think we did that in quite a, a good way where we paused every few minutes. Wow, that, I, that actually kind of blew me away. Um, I wasn't, I genuinely, I knew that they put work into this, obviously, but I, I don't know what it was. I just felt like he wouldn't, you know, give us good stuff. 
Because he has been slacking recently, I think, with theories. And it's not his fault. I just think there's like a, a oversaturation of the theorist community these days where you can't really get your own theory in and everybody just accept it. Um, you kind of, you have to have a lot in order for something to be widely accepted. Uh, and so he said, Gregory's a robot. V Vanessa's a robot. Vanessa's Elizabeth. Um, Elizabeth is the CEO of Fazbear Entertainment. Obviously, people are going to, like, strike that down. But this seems very naturally fitting, I would say. I, I think there is a lot of speculation here, but that was expected, I think. So I'm really excited to see what he comes out with next week, because he says it's going to be confusing. Um, I like confusing, because it, it, rang, it does stuff to my brain. <laughs> um... I, I, yeah, I'm really, I'm really excited, um, to see where this goes. So, I mean, join me next week, I guess. We'll, we'll be sat here again, uh, watching the second part. So make sure you subscribe for when, uh, that, to see when that comes out. I'm sorry I can't speak today. Um, also, I feel like he should have waited until, uh, reading the Bobby Dot's conclusion. Uh, <laughs> Because there's a few things, like, there's a big, there's some big lore drops in there, and I feel like he's going to get a lot of the later security breach parts wrong. But, you know, he's human. He's going to make mistakes. Uh, I mean, the book isn't even out yet, so, I mean, fair enough. <laughs> anyway, thank you guys so much for watching. Uh, leave a comment down below. Tell me what you thought uh, about some of the points that I brought up. Anyway, thank you so much for watching, and I will see you next time. Goodbye.